Now, you know this mountain range in Nepal and this high, high mountain called Mount Everest. I think nine of the 12 highest mountains in the world are in Nepal. I've been to Nepal for a few days, once, 1998. And most people know the name of the highest mountain in the world, and not everybody knows the name of the second highest mountain in the world. Anybody know the name of the second highest mountain? K2. K2, also in Nepal. Well, neither the Pope, nor the primate, nor the king, nor Billy Graham put me in charge of deciding this, but I have decided the highest place in the Old Testament. It's Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is the Mount Everest of the Old Testament. There's no higher place in the Old Testament than Genesis 22, in my opinion. I'm not in charge of deciding these things. But I, I decided to decide. So it's, I think it's Genesis 22. I don't know where K2 is. Maybe Exodus 33, where Moses cries out to God, show me your glory. But I think the Mount Everest of the Old Testament is in Genesis 22. Because in Genesis 22, we see a picture of God and we see a picture of Christ like no other place. Deep, deep, deep in the Old Testament. I tell you that in Genesis 14 we see an important word which shows up for the first time, two important words, the word war and the word tithe. In Genesis 22, another important word shows up for the first time. It's the word love. The first time the word love shows up in the Bible. It came about after these things. After Isaac had been born, after Ishmael left, the boy is probably 14 or 15 years old by now. And Abraham has just been enjoying these days of being a dad, having a son, after waiting for so long. After those days, God tested Abraham. God proved him. And he said, Abraham, he speaks to him again. And Abraham says, here I am. And he says, take now your son, your only son, the son whom you there it is, first time in the Bible, the son whom you love. Now, if you would ask me, if I didn't know, and you asked me, well, in what context does the word love first show up in the Bible? I'd say, well, it's got to be God's love for man. It's got to be. And you say, no, that's not it. What is it then? Well, I say, well, then it's got to be man's love for God. It's got to be. You say, no, it's not that. I'd say, well, if it's not God's love for man, if it's not man's love for God, then it's got to be a man's love for a woman. You say, no, it's not that. The first time the word love shows up in the Bible, it's the context of a man's love for a son. Now, ladies, don't feel left out. This has nothing to do with gender, okay? It has nothing to do with gender. Um, by the way, if you struggle with the gender assignments in the Bible, that God is a father and Jesus is a son, think about us poor men when we realize that we are part of the bride of Christ. Think how hard that is. That's a very hard thing for a man to sort out. As a matter of fact, we don't think about that much at all because we can't think about it. It's too awkward to think about. I think probably C.S. Lewis has the key. C.S. Lewis said, I mean, some people, especially today, think that it's a good thing to do to feminize God and to bring out his feminine qualities. Well, let me just say that every good quality in a woman they get from God. Of course. Of 
course. No problem there. Who else would they get a good quality from? So every lovely quality in a woman and every lovely quality which is distinctively feminine in which we associate with a woman, we find the original of that quality in God, of course. All qualities originate in God, all good qualities. But C.S. Lewis has a better idea than to feminize God. C.S. Lewis is commenting on this business of how can we males think of ourselves as being a part of the bride of Christ. Here's what Lewis says. He says, the great God who made everything, the great God who rules everything, is so powerful, so strong. The word Elohim means the one who is to be feared. The root of Elohim, El, comes from a root which means the strong one. Why do we fear him? Because he's strong. C.S. Lewis says this great strong Elohim is so masculine, so strong, that all of us are feminine compared to him. I think that's a great explanation. So he says, what's your problem? You're a part of the bride of Christ and you're a male. You may think you're strong, but you're not as strong as him. You're just a girl compared to his strength. Hard for a man to choke that down, but I think that's the reality. Well, so if you're a woman, don't, don't, don't be distressed by what I'm about to say because it doesn't really have anything to do with gender, okay? Why is the first use of love in the Bible the love of a father for a son? Well, I want to say because the love of a father for a son is the key to everything. You say, you mean it's the key to love? No, 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 it's the key to everything. You say, you, you mean it's the key to theology? No, 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 it's the key to everything. You mean it's the key to the Bible? No, 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 it's the key to everything. You mean it's the key to the gospel? No, 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 it's the key to everything. It's the key to everything. Everything that was made, everything that exists, everything that, is, that ever will happen in the future through all of eternity will be there, will exist, will happen because of the Father's love for the Son. And God says something which is from every human perspective terrible. From a human perspective, it's more terrible than what happened between Noah and his sons. From a human perspective, it's more terrible than what happened between Lot and his daughters. Because even though those things were perverted and immoral and unspeakable, they at least involved a measure of affection, perverted affection, but affection. But what God asks Abraham to do is not something we can even imagine. God says, um, take now your son, your only son, your irreplaceable son, the son that you waited a hundred years for. The son whom you love. The son whom I promised, Isaac. And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will tell you. First, God appeared to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees, to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees in chapter 12, and he said, I want you to leave your home and go to a place that I'll show you because there I'll give you a son. Now he says, I want you to leave your home and go to a place that I will show you, for there I'll take away your son. 
Remember when I told you the first lesson of um, Theology 101? Remember that? First lesson of Theology 101. God is God and we are not. You know what this is? You know what Genesis 22 is for Abram, Abraham? It's the final exam. These are the finals. There's one question on the exam. Who's God? You or me? Um, this is a dangerous thing to think about. And we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk more about it. Um, one interesting thing is that in verse 3, it says that Abraham rose early in the morning and he left immediately. Instant obedience, a fast obedience. When God seems to be requiring something hard of me, I usually try to delay and put it off and procrastinate and say, well, let's wait, let's talk about this. God required the hardest possible thing from Abraham, and it says he, rode, he rose early in the morning and he left. He, was, he obeyed instantly. Let me share this with you. It takes a long time to cultivate an immediate obedience. You understand that? It takes a long time to get to the point where we obey God immediately. It takes a long time to cultivate an instant obedience. How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing with an instant obedience? How's that coming along in your life? And how could and how could Abraham get up early and leave and instantly obey an order so terrible, so horrible, so unimaginable? Probably because he'd come to the place of absolute trust. And he trusted that even though the beginning of the journey seemed horrible, the end of the journey would not be horrible because it was God's idea, it was God's command, it was God's requirement. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com.